Over the next few lessons, we're going to examine the use of frequency analysis to cryptanalyze monoalphabetic ciphers. But our primary aim is to start understanding the broader context in which randomness and cryptosystem security is related. We'll begin with an overview of the underlying reasons why frequency analysis works for these ciphers, but we'll also look at some of the practical realities that complicate even the straightforward cryptanalytic techniques. In the next lesson, we'll look at multi-character frequencies, though in the interest of time, we'll largely limit ourselves to focusing on two-letter sequences or digraphs, and in particular, repeated digraphs. In the final lesson, we'll explore a couple of examples. First, we'll look at a relatively short piece of ciphertext and see how the variation in letter frequencies complicates the use of this technique. And finally, we'll look at a somewhat longer piece of ciphertext to get a feel for how quickly these variations average out, given enough material to work with. Imagine that Alice constructs a plain text message that is nothing but a sequence of truly random characters and transmits that to Bob, with no encryption. Eve intercepts it and, thinking that it must be ciphertext, tries to cryptanalyze it. Not surprisingly, she'll fail to do so. In fact, it might as well be the ciphertext associated with a one-time pad, which we know is an unbreakable cipher, the only unbreakable cipher. So why are all other ciphers, at least in theory, breakable? It's all about randomness and the lack thereof. Unless the specific goal is to transmit a random sequence of characters, which occasionally it is, the plain text message is always highly non-random because information requires structure to communicate. In fact, later when we look at information theory, we'll see that the very notion of information and randomness are intimately linked. If our enciphering algorithm leaves some or all of this structure intact within the ciphertext, then an adversary has a lot to work from. In the case of a monoalphabetic cipher, none of the structure of the plain text is removed. We are simply using a different alphabet. Imagine someone growing up learning that the character A looks like P. In other words, they learn everything about the English language that we do, including the names and sounds of each character and the spelling of each word. But they just happen to use a different shape to write each letter, the shape that corresponds to our ciphertext alphabet. They would be able to read our ciphertext as though it were the plaintext because, to them, it is the plaintext. Thus, it has all of the structure of the plaintext message and it's a cryptanalyst's dream. So how can Eve exploit this structure to break a monoalphabetic cipher? By noting that we use symbols in our alphabet in highly non-random ways. Some letters are used much more frequently than others. In addition, some letter combinations are very common, while others almost never occur. The cryptanalyst first makes an assumption about the nature of the plaintext, primarily what language it is written in and what the general type of content it contains. They then build a statistical model of how the characters in the language would be expected to appear in a typical piece of plain text. Then they examine how that model would be transformed during the encryption process and how they might identify its traces in the ciphertext. In the case of a monoalphabetic cipher, this is extremely straightforward, which is why we start with it. First, let's consider single character frequency analysis. Here is the more or less standard table of overall frequency usage of the 26 characters in the English language. You can get this list from numerous sources, and while there is usually some variation, most will strongly show this overall pattern. Most of this variability reflects the variability between subject areas and even between different authors. In fact, given enough material to work with, these small differences can be used as evidence that a particular author did or did not write a particular piece of historical work or to estimate not only what language the plain text was written in, but even perhaps what the likely subject area is, say technical, medical, or literature. Let's examine this table to see what it reveals. If every character were used equally often and it was only the ordering of the characters that conveyed information, then we would expect each character to account for just under 4% of all the characters in any sufficiently long piece of text. However, note that the most frequently used nine letters or about a third of the characters, are each used between 150% to more than 300% as often as the average, and that between them account for 70% of all characters in a typ typical piece of English text. In fact, the six most frequent characters, E-T-A-O-I-N, often referred to as Eteoin, account for more than half. 
If our cipher is simply a generic Caesar shift cipher, we can simply look for the most frequently used letter and assume that it represents E. That will be correct far more often than not. But if that doesn't work, we could assume either that the most frequently used letter was T, or that the second most frequently used letter is E. If neither of these pans out, we can continue down a decision tree that, on average, will allow us to break the cipher much more quickly than brute force, which, of course, isn't that difficult either in this case. But for a random monoalphabetic cipher, this won't help us very much even if we correctly identify E. The simple fact is that E is so common that, by itself, it actually conveys very little information. You can think of E as mostly being glue that holds the surrounding information-bearing characters together. But imagine if we can correctly guess the correct mapping for just the top six characters. We would have about half of the ciphertext deciphered, and it is very likely we would be able to then spot several places where the only possible mappings for some of the other characters would be readily apparent. Each additional character we map not only increases the amount of plain text that we can leverage, but reduces the possible choices for the remaining characters. The other end of the distribution can also be quite helpful. The least frequently used third, or nine characters, only account for 7.5% of all characters, and the bottom six account for only 2%. If we can identify most of these, at least as a group, then that significantly reduces the number of choices for the remaining unknown characters. At this point, you might be thinking that breaking a random monoalphabetic cipher is trivially easy. Just map the letter frequencies of the ciphertext to the plaintext. Unfortunately, this is seldom the case. The cryptogram puzzles that you see in newspapers are usually carefully constructed to make this approach fairly work fairly well. But in the real world, it isn't so simple. First, keep in mind the statistical nature of the letter frequencies and how they vary from subject area and author, among other factors. Further, ciphertexts tend to be fairly short. For instance, the procedures for Enigma prohibited messages longer than 250 characters, and many messages were well under 100. As with most things, the less data you have, the more it will tend to deviate from the average. Furthermore, it is quite common for the originator of the ciphertext to modify the plain text to make it even shorter, not unlike people today do when they're texting which not only introduces a lot of unfamiliar and seemingly random letter sequences into the plain text, but it also distorts the letter frequency distribution of an already very small sample of material. Even if you have perfectly recovered the plain text, it might not be immediately obvious. Consider the following 250 character intercept. Is this plain text or is it ciphertext? This is from Moby Dick by Herman Melville. I extracted this from a public domain copy of the work and generated a plain text file by only keeping the letters, converted to uppercase, and placing them in groups of five with ten groups per line. This is something, this or something similar, was quite common practice so as to remove spaces, punctuation, and other cues that are extremely helpful to a cryptanalyst. It also allows the person deciphering it to stay synced to the cipher key in case a letter gets dropped or if a single letter is interpreted as two. Remember, enciphered messages like this were often transmitted via radio by Morse code. Of course, this removes some important content, and a real cipher system would have to deal with this. Spaces between words were usually left out, and it was left up to the receiving operator to identify and insert them. But other important non-letter content was converted into letter equivalents, such as using an uncommon letter for a question mark, which distorts the frequency distribution, or spelling out numbers. We'll ignore this purely for the sake of convenience, but it gives a glimpse into the fact that enciphering messages involves quite a bit of pre- and post-processing on the part of the operators. Getting back to our example here, when given a block of text like this and told that it is the result of a monoalphabetic cipher, many people, as in cryptography students, will proceed to attempt to apply frequency analysis and often struggle mightily because it doesn't lead to real obvious mappings, and most of the mappings that they try leave them struggling to identify recognizable words. Imagine their chagrin when it is eventually revealed that they've been working with pure plain text all along, and when they claim that they were lied to since they were told it was the result of a monoalphabetic cipher, it's pointed out that a Caesar shift cipher with a shift of zero is a monoalphabetic cipher. Of course, some students will spot that it is plain text right away, and others will come to this conclusion as they work, but many won't, which reveals something worth keeping in mind. In the world of secrets, it is easy to be staring at the truth and not see it for what it is.
To show that this is really straightforward plain text, if we can identify a word somewhere in it, we can then work forward and backward, alternating between dark and light shading of the words. Here is the result. As you can see, there are a lot of familiar words, but also some rather uncommon ones. These uncommon ones, coupled with the lack of a demarcation between words, are the common stumbling blocks that lead many to conclude too quickly that this isn't plain text at all. We'll bring this lesson to a close here, and to recap, frequency analysis of intercepted ciphertext can provide significant clues to aid the cryptanalyst, at least to the degree that non-randomness in the ciphertext is due to non-randomness in the plain text. But frequency analysis isn't a magic bullet, even for a monoalphabetic cipher, because of statistical variability, particularly in limited length samples. Plus, Alice and Bob usually take some steps to intentionally distort the patterns that are manifested in the ciphertext. This is made all the more difficult because even recognizing and reading the plain text is somewhat of an art and an acquired skill. In the next lesson, we'll continue looking at frequency analysis, focusing our attention on multi-symbol sequences and how we might use them.